What's going on guys? My name is Dustin and this is End on a Make. Uh, I just wanted to hop on really quick uh, and record a little thing about what I think was the biggest story of tonight. Uh, it's not Kevin Durant coming back and going perfect from the field, even though that was incredible considering he hasn't played in, I think they said 25 games, 26 games. Uh, no, but what I want to talk about is the game that we saw between the Utah Jazz and the Phoenix Suns. Now, these two teams are at the top of the Western Conference, 1-2. Utah's been pretty much the class of the league all season long. Um, obviously, the Nets in the East have been right up there as well. But Utah's just been consistent pretty much all season long. And this ever since the All-Star break, since they came back, it's been not, not like they've been struggling at all, but they've certainly slowed down a bit like there have been times where they've looked exactly like that juggernaut but at the same time they've they've kind of slowed down a bit from from the pace they were on they've taken a few more L's they've come out a little sluggish they've fallen behind in games pretty quickly and then you know they play catch up and on the flip side the Phoenix Suns have been not under the radar because I don't think a team with Chris Paul and Devin Booker can really go under the radar but they've been, you know, quietly consistent pretty much all year. They've been winning all sorts of games. Chris Paul has had a huge impact on that team, which is something that, I mean, I should say I, I figured he would have a big impact on the team, but I didn't think it would be this big. Like, I'm a, kind of a snob when it comes to, like, I don't know. I wouldn't want to mess with the chemistry. And after I saw how good Phoenix was in the bubble last year, I was convinced that, they should just hold Pat and continue on the path they were on with the players they had because that chemistry in the bubble was something special. And that was without Kelly Oubre Jr., who had been out at that point and missed the entire bubble. So I really thought, oh, they're going to get Kelly Oubre back. They're going to be the perfect blend of, you know, young talent, these little bit more experienced players. They're going to get, but instead, they trade for Chris Paul and it's played. Or play, it's paid complete dividends so far this year for them. So they find themselves 1-2. They have an instant classic game tonight that ends up going to overtime. And Phoenix ekes out the win. Now, I think that this is the type of matchup that would be an ideal Western Conference Finals. I know there's teams like the Lakers, the Clippers, and the Nuggets that are... I'm, maybe not better or in, but like they're they're probably considered the favorites a bit more they have a bit more established stars their you know their ceilings are considered higher for whatever reason but a lot of things would have to break right for any of those three teams to really make a deep run for the Lakers you have to hope that Anthony Davis and LeBron James get back and they stay totally healthy because without both of them I don't really think there's any chance for the Lakers, unfortunately, as someone who is wearing a Kobe shirt. Um, for the Nuggets, it's kind of just a we've we've seen them there before, and now we're at a point where it's it's prove it, it's show us. Um, similar to the Clippers, I guess Paul George is also dealing with a toe injury, um, which you know anything with feet is always problematic when you are a professional athlete. So I don't know about that. So there's all these, all these like. I don't want to say openings, but there's all these realistic paths for teams like Utah and Phoenix to get in. So to see the two of them in this matchup tonight really got me thinking about how perfect it would be. I don't know how well they would do in the finals against like the Bucks, the Sixers or the Nets. But in terms of just like game to game series. I think that this could be one of the best possible matchups. You have Chris Paul, you have Donovan Mitchell, you have Cam Johnson, DeAndre Ayton, you have Mike Conley, Rudy Gobert. Like, there's just stars across both rosters. And the thing that makes it so interesting to me is the way that these two teams match up stylistically. So tonight, I'm going to go off of just the games that they had tonight. And for Phoenix, it was a lot of their big three. It was Devin Booker with 35 points. It was Chris Paul with 29 and 9. And it was DeAndre Ayton with 18 and 12. When I say 18 and 12, that is 18 and 12 going directly at Rudy Gobert basically the whole night. And Rudy Gobert finished this game without a block. 
which is insane to me. A defensive player of the year, perennial candidate as well. I think he's one of the favorites this year, too. Got a block. Devin Booker also attempted 10 free throws, which means he was just getting to the line. He was getting those calls and kind of disrupted the entire Jazz game plan. And on the flip side, Donovan Mitchell went off. He had 41. He had eight rebounds. He had a few assists as well, but he wasn't efficient. And the thing that this Jazz offense has thrived on all season long has been their efficiency. You have, you know, Mike Conley making plays, setting the table. Bogdan Bogdanovich out there making making shots, hitting open shots. And then Gobert in the middle, of course, who is like the anchor of the defense when it comes to keeping everyone moving, clearing out the paint, making the teams take those harder outside-the-paint shots. And then Jordan Clarkson, who is probably going to win sixth man of the year this year. I mean, the Jazz have been that good, and he has looked like that good of a player for the most part of this season. But tonight it was kind of just like an example of, of how everything can go wrong for them. So on the season, they're shooting about 40% from three, which is just good enough to be second. I think they're just behind the Clippers for second. And then the Clippers are first. So tonight, they go 11 for 44. With Donovan Mitchell going four for 12 and Mike Conley going one for seven, respectively. And when they're not hitting those threes, everything kind of comes to a halt. Because one thing that's been true about the Jazz this season is how... They've just ramped up the number of threes they're taking, but the efficiency has stayed the same from where it was last year when they looked like an unbelievable team. And that's part of why people were like, oh, this Jazz team is legit now is because they're getting these threes and they're hitting them at the same efficiency. They're just hitting more. So, of course, they're blowing out teams. Of course, they're overwhelming these teams. You have the team defense that the Jazz have combined with that shooting. A reliable sixth man. Defensive Player of the Year candidate and a superstar in Donovan Mitchell. I mean, it's understandable, and they're a great team to watch, that is for sure. But tonight we saw pretty much everything go wrong for the Jazz, and they still almost pulled out this game. And part of it is due to Donovan Mitchell, who, like I said, 41 points, but he took 35 shots, which is as many as Rudy Gobert, Mike Conley, and Jordan Clarkson took combined. Now, that's not to say that Donovan Mitchell can't take over and assert his dominance and win that team a game on his own. We've seen him do it many times already in his young career, including in the playoffs. So I don't want to say that. But for a young team like Phoenix, it's almost like holding like two sides of a coin, I guess, is kind of what I wanted to talk about as the main point of this video, is you see what an impact that the veteran point guard can have. Like, Mike Conley had a hard time fitting in last year for Utah, and that's probably why they struggled, and that's why they probably underwhelmed and underachieved in, in so many people's eyes. So this year, he's played very well. He was an all-star for the first time, finally, and he has fit in perfectly with that offense. He's been exactly what you want. But Chris Paul is Chris Paul. And to see the impact that he has had in keeping... Devin Booker composed in tight situations, which, I mean, Devin Booker's a born scorer, but, like, it's been the subtle developments in his game as far as playmaking, the attacking the basket, knowing when to, you know, hold the ball to milk the clock a bit more, knowing tempos and stuff like that. It's, like, it's just subtleties in his game that we've seen. And he's completely invigorated DeAndre Ayton, who now looks a lot more like what you would expect from a number one pick. He has been just dominant in the pick and roll with both Booker and with Chris Paul. And I think that's the type of development that comes when you get a skilled playmaker like that. So you have like the pick and roll between, you know, Conley and Gobert and Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton. You have the the shooting guard who can just go off on a given night with Mitchell and Booker. And then you have all of these extra role guys. You have, you know, Mikhail Bridges, you have Cam Johnson, you have Jay Crowder now. With Phoenix, and then over on the other side, you have Jordan Clarkson, Joe Ingles, Boyan Bogdanovich. Like I don't, I don't need to go through all the names. And I think that this is the type of series that I don't want to say the NBA would really want it, because obviously, in a position as prestige as the Western Conference Finals, with as many eyes on it, you want the stars. Like you want Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, LeBron James, 
Anthony Davis. You want the name of the Lakers. You want the you want that rivalry. You want that because that's the bigger the bigger selling point. But with two young teams like this, where the final score is like in the one twenty, like that's the type of exciting stuff that fans don't always get to see. Like those types of games, like playoff games and finals games in particular, can often be just a battle just a slog just the defensive everyone's tired everyone's missing shots especially you get near like a game six game seven get late in the series but this matchup between these two teams i would absolutely if i could say hey this is how the rest of the season is going to go and this is where we end up is a seven game series between the jazz and the suns i wouldn't be mad i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say like I'm not watching now because it's it, but I think it's a good chance for for the league to put new stars out there. Like if you put a DeAndre Ayton, a Devin Booker, a Donovan Mitchell, you put them all out there on that stage, and you just build new stars on that biggest scale. It doesn't hurt the league. All it does is put more eyes on the product. All it does is help grow, you know, the brand of the league. Yes, but then also you get more fans to these teams. So I think from a basketball standpoint, this might be assuming that the Lakers don't get everyone back healthy in time or like injuries linger or something. I think this is the series I want to see. I think this game was absolutely incredible. I can't wait to watch it back again because this was it was just so back and forth. You saw everything that makes both of these teams the top teams in the in the conference. And when they're playing, you know, for the Jazz to have an off shooting game from three. Rudy Gobert only takes seven shots, doesn't get blocked. Mike Conley shoots, I want to say he was four for 15 from the field. Like, you get all these things, and it still comes down to, like, two buckets is the difference between winning and losing for the best team in the West. And it's just, you know, when you have that type of of team that can perform in these circumstances and, and can win any type of game, to me, it makes a more exciting game to watch because neither of these teams is ever really out of it. It could be a 15-point deficit, 20-point deficit. It does not matter. And to me, that's the thing that, that truly makes this a exciting potential matchup. I think it's absolutely possible. I think if these teams stay on this level, they could go toe-to-toe with the Clippers, with the Nuggets, like I said, with the Lakers as well. And it would be really interesting to see if one of these two teams gets hot, rides it to the Western final or to the NBA finals, and then we see what happens, you know, up against those premier teams. I mean, this is all speculation. This is all what what NBA fandom is all about, pretty much. So let me know in the comments if you agree with me. If you think that one of these two teams would probably be the most fun to have in the NBA finals, assuming, you know whatever happens with health for everyone else and and stuff like that let's you know be be that what it may um let me know what you think let me know if you think that these two teams are really the best teams in the conference or if they're just lucky that these other guys are hurt and and yeah if you've watched this whole thing thank you and i'll be back soon thank you